Okay, so let's start. So as I mentioned, today we are going to talk about generalization in deep learning. So before uh, you know, diving into some recent results in uh, deep learning generalization, I'm going to quickly overview some classical generalization uh, results in uh, learning in general. And then we are going to see what kind of these, what, which one of these results extend to the deep learning setup and which ones don't. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's uh, start with uh, setting up this problem. We are given a training set. Let's say my training set is like this. So I have N samples. I'm gonna call these samples by ZI. That includes my XI and YI, both my features and labels. And we'll have N samples. So as you, you know, as we, this, this, you know, we covered it last lecture, so we are going to define a loss function and we are going to fit a function uh, to be able to predict y using x's. So my goal is to, let's say for a function in my hypothesis class, in my function class, I'm going to define a loss function over my training set. Now, like, because, you know, we want to see how this loss extends to the test set. So I'm going to index it with S to be clear. So for a given function H, I'm going to evaluate my uh, uh, quality of my function with the training set by looking at the ERM objective, which is just looking at the average loss that I'll see over different training samples that I have. Right, so this is also called the empirical loss over training set. Okay, so one assumption that we have here is that these samples that I have in my training set, these ZIs, which is basically XI and YIs, they come from a distribution PXY. So there's an underlying distribution that generate these samples. But the problem is that I don't know about this distribution. I have observed some samples from this distribution, but I don't know a closed form or a parametric form of this distribution. So this is in general unknown. So the only thing that I know is that I uh, basically have some samples from this distribution. So since I don't have access to the underlying distribution, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to minimize my empirical loss over the training set. So I'm gonna pick a function H from my function class, from my hypothesis class to minimize this empirical loss. And this is the function that I'll call HS star. So this is the best function or a good function that minimizes my training loss. Okay, but ideally, I want to pick a function that minimizes my population loss if I had access to the underlying distribution. Of course, I don't have that distribution, but let's see what is the ideal case. My ideal case is to look at the population loss. So here, my loss, I'm going to denote it by LD of H. So D stands for the distribution. And here, I'm going to look at Zs that are distributed according PXY. Let's say I have access to this distribution, and I'm going to look at the expected loss for a given function H. So this is going to be my population loss. Obviously, you know, unless you know, we have some assumptions about PXY, in practice, we cannot compute LD of H. But let's say if I could compute LD of H, I could potentially pick a function H from my hypothesis class that minimizes the population loss. And we call this HD. 
D star. So this is the uh, solution uh, that minimizes the population loss. So uh, there's a question, uh, H here is my function and uh, capital H is the hypothesis class, function class. For instance, if you are optimizing over neural networks, H would be one instance of a neural network with a particular parameter set and capital H would be a set of you know, neural networks with a particular architectures and particular uh, activation functions. Okay. So again, my goal is to learn a good function used in, in my training set that also uh, has a good performance in the test set or in the population setting. And that is the whole uh, idea of generalization, bounding a generalization error of, uh, of uh, the training uh, set function. All right, so let's look at the picture here. Let's say I have one dimensional uh, function uh, class, hypothesis class, just for simplicity. Okay, so if I look at the population loss, my population loss would be something like this. Let's say my, this is the LD of H. And here I have HD star. Right, so this is the one that minimizes, perhaps it should, um, is the minimizer. So this is HD star. Okay, so this function that I, this curve here is not random, right? So I, I'm looking at the expectation of my loss over PXY. So I'm basically averaging out every possible randomness in my uh, population loss. So this function is not random. So if you give me PXY, if you give me the underlying distribution, I can just uh, deterministically compute this function and plot this function. So this is going to be my population loss. But what about the empirical loss? So in the empirical loss here, we have randomness through S. I'm drawing NIID samples from my population distribution. And based on that, I'll get one curve for my empirical loss. So let's say I draw NIID samples and it happens that I get maybe a loss function like this. This is my empirical loss over training set S, right? But this curve has randomness. If I throw, draw another NIID samples from my distribution, I may end up uh, getting another curve. I may end up getting, let's say, a curve like this. So this may be for another training set S prime of H. All right, so the minimizer of the empirical loss for a particular training set is denoted by HS star. So the whole idea of uh, learning theory and understanding the generalization of the models is that I want to make sure that uh, my performance over uh, a particular training set can be generalizable to uh, a new training set. So if you give me some new samples, let's say my test set, then I'll have also a good performance on that set. So in other words, somehow I want these curves to be close to each other. I don't actually need these curves to be close to each other on some part of the, uh, some part of the uh, you know, hypothesis class that they are not performing well, so I'm not gonna select them. But at least over functions that I'm going to select in my uh, training, I want those functions to also have a good uh, performance in the population setting. All right, so that's the, the, the whole goal. Okay, so in order to do that, we can quantify uh, different measures to see if a particular function, HS star, has a good performance in the population or in the test setting. So one uh, such uh, measure is to look at LD HS star. So if I evaluate my function, HS star, in the population loss, and I look at the difference 
of LD at HD star. So this is the best population loss I can get because HD star minimizes the population loss. So this is going to be the smallest population loss that I can get, assuming that I can solve the optimization uh, you know, that we you know, uh, covered in the last lecture. But here, I want to look at the uh, value of the loss in the population setting if I evaluated using the function that has been computed over the empirical, uh, using the empirical data set. So if you look at the picture here, maybe I can use another color. So this is my HS star. Right. So let me actually erase this um, green curve just to make it a little bit simpler. All right, so this is the HS star. So this value here that I have, it is LS of HS star. So this is the value of my uh, function evaluated over the empirical loss. But I don't care about this. What I care is that if I evaluate this function in the in, in the population loss function, this is going to be my LD HS star. I want to see what is the, uh, how much loss I'm going to suffer. And in particular, I want to compare it with the best loss. So this is the best population loss, meaning it is the smallest population loss that I can get. And I want to look at this gap. So this is the gap that we have here, and that's exactly this formula that we have here. So I evaluate HS star in the LD function and I compare it with the best uh, function that minimizes the LD and that will be my estimation error. So this is called estimation error. Okay, so let me pause, I see a few questions. Okay, I'm happy that you guys are answering each other's questions. Um, if there are any remaining questions, you can uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Okay, so let's carry on. Okay, so one of the uh, you know, main uh, objectives of, uh, I would say classical learning theory classical learning theory is to basically argue that if my hypothesis class, if my uh, set of function H is sufficiently small compared to the number of samples that I'm drawing from my distribution, then for any distribution, for any PXY, so because I don't know what PXY is, but is my underlying distribution, for any distribution, I can have a bound on this estimation error. So obviously this bound is not going to be deterministic because I have randomness because of the samples S. So I want this estimation error to be small with high probability. So what is the goal here? The goal here is that, let's say for any distribution PXY, if my number of samples is above a certain number, let's say n, n0, I can argue that the probability of this quantity, my estimation error, LDHS star minus LDHD star to be, let's say, smaller than epsilon, I want this to be small, is high. So this probability is greater or equal to one minus delta. So this objective, if a hypothesis class satisfies this objective, it is called pack learnable. Pack stands for probably approximately correct. Right, so probably with high probability, approximately, so we want this estimation uh, error to be small, correct. So that's basically the definition of uh, pack learnability. 
And epsilon and delta, they are uh, basically parameters of my pack learnability um, definition. So I can, you know, have a relationship between n naught, epsilon, and delta. And there are a lot of results uh, about that. Okay, so, so one of the, uh, uh, and n I see a question, n is the number of samples, right? So n is the, you know, number of uh, IIT samples I'm drawing from my distribution. So one of the uh, classical result in learning theory is, is something called bias variance trade-off. Bias variance trade-off. So what is this trade-off? So let me rewrite this uh, estimation error in a different form. So I have, basically my goal is that if I evaluate HS star, so this is the function, optimal function over my training uh, loss. If I evaluate in the, the population, I want this loss to be sufficiently small. So I can just uh, write this loss function as LD HD star. So I just add and subtract this term. So nothing uh, complicated. So I have the term in the, left hand side and I just subtract by LD HD star. So it's obvious that this equation holds. But now let, let's look at these terms. These are interesting terms. So do I have any randomness in the first term here? I have HD star, which is the minimizer of my population loss. So there is no randomness in the first part. So this term is called the bias term. So in order to reduce this term, you uh, may want to increase the complexity of your hypothesis class, because if you are looking at more and more complex functions, and let's say you have access to the underlying distribution PXY, you'll be able to push down this, law, uh, this um, bias term as much as possible. So if, let's say the complexity of H increase, then the bias term is going to decrease. So what about this term? So this term is exactly your estimation error. So I'm basically evaluating my uh, HS uh, star in the population dot and you know, comparing it with the best population uh, loss that I could get. So this term has randomness, as we mentioned in pack learnability, uh, you know, we, we wanna have a bound on the estimation error, you know, probabilistic fashion. So this term is called oftentimes the variance term because of the uh, uh, randomness that we, we have in this term because of the set of samples. Right, uh, now like if you are increasing the complexity of your function class, then you may expect that uh, this estimation error is going to increase, right? Uh, because you know, you're looking at a larger uh, family of functions, so you may end up in an overfitting uh, situation, right? So that was uh, one of the intuitions from classical learning theory, and the emphasis is on the was part. So, in fact, uh, I'm going to argue this is not uh, this is not uh, complete. This is not a complete picture. So, in other words, the previous view, and if you look at a lot of uh, classical uh, machine learning books, you're going to uh, basically get the see a curve like this. So, the, if this is the complexity of H, then uh, and this is the risk. So if the complexity increases, the bias term uh, is going to decrease, but the variance term is going to increase. So this is the variance term. So if you look at the uh, combination of these two curves, you are going to end up with a curve like this, and that's what uh, was called the bias variance trade-off. Right? So you, you don't want your function class to be too small, because in that case, your bias term is going to dominate your error, 
right? So if your if your underlying relationship is very nonlinear and you fit a linear function, it's not going to perform well, right? Because you know even if you have infinite number of samples, then you have some inherent uh, you know bias term that is going to dominate your uh, your test error. But also you probably don't want your function or be thought that you don't want your function to be too uh, big uh, because in that case you may memorize your samples and your um, estimation error is going to be very high. So if you evaluate that function in your test set, then you are not going to see a good performance. And in this regime, then the variance term is going to dominate. So there's like a sweet spot here that you are not, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, overfitting, you are not memorizing and your hypothesis class is rich enough to capture some of the underlying, um, uh, underlying relationships between uh, X's and Y's. However, I just wanna, you know, before even going forward, saying that uh, this is not a complete picture, not complete. And probably you have realized in the previous lectures that I was talking about the overparameterization results in the optimization of neural networks. We had the case that the number of parameters, you know, or you can even think about that as the complexity of your hypothesis class was potentially too high. You had the number of parameters larger than the number of samples, right? In those cases, then, you know, we should, you know, if this curve was uh, complete, we should uh, have mem just memorized and we shouldn't have learned anything meaningful, but we'll see if that is the case or not during this lecture. Okay, so um, let me uh, see, there are some questions. Uh, Phil, go ahead. Uh, so just to restate, so the decomposition in blue, that is mathematical fact, but then the quadratic shaped risk curve is intuition only. That is correct. So this is what we thought, right? And you know, in fact, on under some um, some regimes, you can even uh, mathematically characterize these curves. And I'm going to do some of that uh, potentially in the next lecture. Um, and you will see, in fact, some part of this curve is correct. But I'm not saying this curve is not correct. I'm you know saying this curve is not complete. And that's basically the point that we are going to. Uh, make it in the uh, in today's lecture and uh, Thursday's lecture. Uh, Katami, go ahead. Uh, for neural networks, can we truly say like uh, the number of parameters actually uh, uh, are are good indicators for the complexity of the model? Like uh, probably in uh, um, like lower uh, higher bi sorry lower bias uh, regime, maybe most of them are kind of off like even though we have like the same number of parameters so that's a that's a great question and that's a great point uh, number of parameters uh, may not actually indicate the complexity of your function class right so uh, that's one measure one kind of empirical measure that uh, probably correlates with the complexity but it may not be uh, a good characterization and there are, I'm going to talk about some of the other measures that people, they have been looking into it. For instance, you know, different types of norms in the function space that you can, you know, define to see if, uh, if your function class is complex or not. But nevertheless, so the argument here is that intuitively, if your uh, complexity um, is large, and especially if your number of parameters is larger than the number of samples, then, you know, obviously you can just memorize, you know, under some mild conditions, your training set. So in those cases, you know, we shouldn't have expected to have a good performance because the complexity, even in that uh, particular measure is way too high. But that's not the case in practice. And we are going to argue uh, what is uh, potentially going on. And obviously this is a very active area of research. So we don't have like the full answers yet, but you know, hopefully after you know, today's lecture and Thursday's lecture, you'll have a, a, a bit more complete picture about the generalization results in deep learning. Okay, so I see a few more questions. 
Okay, perfect. So I'm really happy that you guys are answering each other's questions in the chat box. That saves a little bit of time for us. Okay, so you know, before diving into the deep learning uh, results, let me, you know, let me uh, do a warm up and see, you know, can we somehow, you know, characterize some of these uh, classical learning theory results. So for simplicity, I'm going to uh, look at the decomposition of my loss and a particular function, I'm going to define it as f. So here, if you look at the objective that we have here, so we have a function h, and then I'm applying that fun a loss function on top of that function. So I'm going to just call a uh, composition of L and uh, H just by F. Okay, so in that case, I can just write my training loss as the average values of F over ZIs. Again, ZI is uh, short for XI and YIs. Just to simplify some notations, and my population loss would be just the expected value of f of z when z is distributed according to px and y. Okay, so some notations. All right, so I'm going to also have uh, one more notation, which is the capital F. So capital F is when I'm applying this loss function over uh, different, uh, basically, uh, members of my hypothesis uh, class. So this is defined as I'm composing L and H for every H in my hypothesis class. So if you evaluate this on your samples, then you are going to, let's say you pick one F, which is the composition of your loss and a particular function h, and you apply it to different training samples that you have. So you, you'll get f of z1. Um, so I apply this f function over different values uh, that I have, f of z n. So this is the one element of F. So this is basically F applied to S, my training samples. So here I have F, another value, for, you know, another function F. So I'm not, I'm not gonna write it down. So I'm gonna write uh, basically for every F in my big uh, function class F. So this vector is an n-dimensional vector right? because I'm applying a particular function uh, f to all of my training samples. Okay. Let me see. Okay. So is this clear? So I just define some notations to simplify some of the calculations. The composition of L and H is my uh, small f. This is my Empirical loss is my population loss. The capital F is basically when I'm applying, uh, you know, this composition to all of my hypothesis, uh, uh, my functions in the hypothesis class. And when I'm composing this capital F and S, I'm applying each of these F functions to uh, N training samples. So I'll get a vector of length N. How many of them? So I'll have basically, based on the number of uh, functions that I have in capital F, I'm going to get these many vectors. Okay, so, so what is the goal here? So I talked about the general, uh, estimation error, but similarly you can define generalization error. What is the generalization error? So you compute your function uh, in uh, using your empirical loss. So this is your function. And then you evaluate this function in your uh, population loss or you know, approximately in your uh, test set. So you look at the difference between these two values. 
you know some people they have different names some people they may refer this uh, to this you know quantity as the cross uh, validation error generalization error but the idea is that this function that i compute hs star has a good performance in the population setup as well okay so instead of um, you know looking at this particular h star because this h star depends on a particular training set a training set and this is the minimizer for that so that's a little bit of a difficult task to do so instead of just bounding this quantity i'm going to have a uniform bound i'm going to say for any h you give me i don't care if this is the minimizer for my empirical laws i want this quantity to be small right so in other words if you look at these curves that we had this is the uh, empirical loss and the population loss, I want these curves to be close to each other everywhere. Right? So even in these parts of my hypothesis uh, class that I don't actually care if these curves are far from each other because I'm not going to see them. Because of the difficulty of characterizing HS star in general, so I'm going to have a sufficient, but not necessary, a sufficient condition that if these two curves are close to each other in any possible age, then I'll be good. So then I can even argue that for the H star, the curves are going to be close to each other. So basically here, just to repeat, I want LD, this is my curve for LD, and let's say I have a curve for LS, I want these curves to be close to each other everywhere. So that's obviously not necessary, but it will be sufficient. And that will be one way to argue about bounding the generalization error. Okay, so how can I do that? I can just simply look at you know, the worst age. So I'm gonna pick an age from my hypothesis class that maximizes this quantity, LD of H minus LS of H. So if I have a bound on this, then obviously that bound will apply to a particular H star and then I'll be happy. So that's the goal. So I want to pick an H that maximizes, that's basically the worst gap between my population and empirical loss. And if I argue that even for that H, I have a bounded difference between these two loss functions, I'm good to go. Okay, so but what is the problem here? The problem here is that I don't have this the, I don't have the underlying distribution in order to compute this population loss. But perhaps we can approximate this. You know, this part is again hand wavy. We can approximate this by basically dividing my training set S to two parts and I'm going to estimate LD of H using a part that I haven't used during the training. And I'm going to estimate LS of H using the other, uh, you know, uh, part of my training set. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to partition S to two parts. It's like cross validation, right? So I'm just, you know, partitioning to two parts. Let's say for now, the same size. And I'm going to approximate this G by G prime, such that this G prime looks at the supremum of H uh, of the difference between two empirical loss functions. Okay, so the second term, this term can be a good approximation of LS of H, but basically the argument here is that we are going to replace this LD of H that we don't know uh, about underlying distribution with evaluation on a batch of samples that we haven't used during the training. And this is in fact the empirical cross validation loss that we compute in practice, right? So when you train a model on your training set and then evaluate it on the tested, you're basically exactly computing this quantity. So this is a good measure in order to see if we could um, have a bound uh, and potentially maybe we can have a bound on uh, G as well. 
All right, so let me rewrite this. Uh, Ls is nothing but just, you know, L composed with H, which be, will be my uh, big function F based on the notations that I have. So I apply F on samples S1, and then I apply F on samples S2. And look at the difference between, between the two. Okay, so let's rewrite the definition of the F here. So again, I'm looking at the supremum over H. So what was the definition of F? F is the, uh, the average loss that I have. Right? So based on um, uh, these definitions that I have here. Right? So here, basically, I have how many samples? One over n over two number of samples. I'm going to look at the samples in my first set. And I'm going to look at the loss of those functions, which will be f of z i. So this is this term is just the f. But the, the why I have n over two because the size of my training set here s one is n over two because I divided my uh, training into two parts. And similarly, I can rewrite f s f of s2 as 1 over n over 2 samples in s2 f of zi. Okay, it's a complicated notation. Let me simplify the notation. So I'm going to, to simplify notation. Simplify notation. I'm going to define sigma i. If a sample is in set one, I have a sigma i of one, otherwise I have a sigma i of minus one in set two. So therefore, with this notation, I can just write the whole thing as, so I have two over n. So the first term is basically sigma i times f z i. And for the second term, I have this minus here, so this minus is observed in you know, a value of the sigma i, and it, again, it is going to be sigma i times f of zi. So the whole thing, therefore, can be written as i1 to n sigma i times f of zi. I know the coefficient of f of zi, if I'm in S2, is minus 1, and I know sigma i for that, based on the definition that I have, is also uh, minus. Okay, so let me see if there are any questions. Did we have a condition that S1 and S2 are disjoint? Yes. So that's basically the whole argument that I'm partitioning my S into two parts. So they don't have any common samples. Okay. Uh, Okay, so, so far I have looked into deterministic partitioning. So I basically partitioned my training set to two parts, deterministic partitioning. But potentially I can, you know, do the partitioning in different ways. Right? So it doesn't have to be in one specific way. So maybe it is better to, you know, partition multiple times and look at this average uh, error that I'm gonna get across the two partitions to have a better estimation of my generalization error. And that's what actually people do in practice. Right? So when you, do a, you are doing a cross validation, maybe you are doing it in you know, different folds. Right? So you randomly partition and then train on the one set and evaluate in the other set, look at the difference, repeat this many times, and uh, see what is the average value that you get. So basically here we wanna do randomized partitioning. So in order to do that, basically what I'm gonna do is my partitioning indicator is going to be random. I'm going to randomly assign a sample to either class one or class two with let's say equal probability. The size of the training sets may not be exactly the same, but they're going to be uh, roughly the same, and in the expectation, it's going to be the same. 
So maybe if I do that, my generalization then can be approximated. If I look at all these uh, partitioning, potential partitioning, I'm going to look at the expectation of the errors that I get uh, about the difference of my loss in the two partitions that I have, and I'm going to repeat it many times, and I'm going to look at the average. Maybe I, this can be a good approximation. So what is this value? So this value is uh, basically for one partition, I have uh, the value of G prime like that. So two over N is a constant, so I'm gonna bring it out of the supremum. And also it comes out of the expectation. So I have expectation over sigma. And then I have supremum over my functions H sum one over n, basically sigma i, f of z i. So basically I, I, I haven't done anything complicated. Right? So I just you know, partition my, my training to two parts, evaluated my loss in each of them, look at the difference, and I'm looking at the average of the uh, difference over uh, different uh, partitions. So this is a good measure, and I can in fact compute it. Right, because I, that's my training set, I can divide it in many ways uh, and uh, see what kind of error we can get. So if this is small, hopefully we'll have a good generalization. Okay, so let me pause and see um, if there are any questions. Is this clear? Uh, one clarification. Yes. So for sigma without the subscript, is that uh, a product of sigma i's? Uh, sigma without, so oh yes. So this is basically a vector of sigmas, right? Sigma one to sigma, um, yeah, basically it is, this is a vector. This is a random vector, right? So for each sample, I decide, with, I flip a coin, and I decide if that sample goes to the first set or the second set, and that will give me a distribution over partitioning. And I average out of my difference of the loss functions across two partitions over uh, different partitions that I get. Thank you. Great. Uh, professor, uh, the two by n term, like since now the S1 and S2 sizes are going to be different, won't the two by N term be different? Right, so here, you know, the, the sizes can be different, but uh, it is still going to be a two by N because here my sigma I is a binomial variable with a mean of one over half. And when I'm looking at the expectation, uh, I'm going to basically get the same size. So it is not that that coefficient is not going to change because I'm looking at uh, the expectation, the average loss over different partitions. All right, so I see uh, a couple of more questions. Does the cross-validation approach perform better than the estimation, estimating P x, y using non-parametric probability distribution estimation method, for example, and then proceed with you know, L of D? Okay, so basically it's a chicken and egg problem, right? So uh, if you, you know, uh, think that, okay, so I'm going to have a, an estimation of PXY using my empirical samples, it is the same problem. Right? So using N observations from a distribution, how you can, you know, compute that distribution itself. And that's gonna be a loser bound because, uh, you know, more vacuous bound because, uh, you know, here you don't actually, uh, care about you know having a good estimation of pxy. So what you care is that your loss, your function evaluated you know on the population loss uh, has is basically a similar error to your training loss. So the demand here, the objective that here we have is a little bit easier than just estimating the distribution everywhere. So that's why these bonds are going to be uh, better than just you know estimating uh, you know the underlying distribution using empirical samples and then you know, evaluate the population loss uh, exactly. Okay, let's move on. Okay, good. 
So this is basically the average cross uh, validation loss. You know, this is a, you know, basically if you look at this uh, objective, this part, let's, you know, have a notation for this. Just to simplify things a little bit, again, notation. I'm going to define a function R applied to a set A. Let's say I have a set A with uh, vectors A1 to A um, N. Right, so I have these N vectors. Uh, so this is going to be defined as one over n expectation over sigma supremum over a in a sum one to n sigma i a i. So that's basically the definition that um, I have here. Oh, in fact, uh, this is not indexed by n. So this is the size of um, number of functions that I can potentially have, right? So if you uh, look at this objective, so when you are getting h from your hypothesis class, this gives you a vector, right? So you get like f of z1 to f of zn, right? So for any such h, you get a vector. So what you're doing is that you, you basically pick a sigma and you multiply sigma i to different elements of this uh, vector and sum it up. Right? So that's basically the generalization that we have here. So you uh, pick a vector a here uh, and you multiply components of that vector. So these are scalars, not vectors, with sigma i, then sum it up and look at the supremum over different vectors that you have. So this is just the uh, rewrite of the expression that we had here. And or set is basically this A for this notation is just F composed with S. Right? So these are the vectors that I have here. So with this notation, so I can rewrite the, um, I can rewrite the expression that I have by just saying that G is equal to two times this R function applied to F composed with S. Right? So this is my A in this notation. And I'm just rewriting this, uh, this uh, expression that I have here. And what I have two here, because in the definition I use one over N, so I have two over n here, so there is a factor of two. This is the right of the expression that we have, the cross validation expression that we have. All right, so this function has a name. It is called Radomarker complexity. Care complexity. And it's one of the uh, very important and classical results in the uh, learning theory. So if I have a small, if I, for a hypothesis class, if I have a small Radomarker complexity, I can in fact have a bound on my generalization error. So there's a theorem, I'm not gonna prove it. You can um, look at some of the uh, classical learning uh, theory books to get the proof. But the proof is uh, saying that the difference between my population loss and my empirical loss is going to be less or equal to two times this rather marker complexity evaluated on my training set plus some constant times um, log of four over delta over n with probability one minus delta. So with, prob with high probability, so if my Radomarker complexity is low, if this guy is small, then I can have a bound on my generalization error with high probability. So here, this is true for every distribution, for any basically PXY, this is true. 
And the proof is in fact not very you know, difficult. So it's roughly speaking the steps that I did here. So the proof follows from that, but you need to be a little bit you know, more uh, careful about some of the steps. So the good news here is that I can compute rather marker complexity for uh, different hypothesis uh, classes uh, quite easily because this calculation is not a difficult calculation, right? So you basically for a set of vectors, you just look at the supremum of uh, your uh, objective, then you're looking at different signs for the components of that. So there is a big literature on rather marker calculus let me give you just one example. So as I mentioned, I'm not gonna you know, dive deep into these classical results. I just wanna give you a feeling and hopefully you have reviewed some of these uh, things in other machine learning courses. Let's say if your hypothesis class is a linear function, class of linear functions, W transpose X, then the norm of W is, let's say bounded, then in this case, the rather marker complexity can be shown that is bounded by the maximum norm of your samples that you have. And this, this is a constant, but the most important thing is that the, uh, in the denominator, I have one over square root of n. Right? So if your n is you know, large enough, this rather marker complexity is going to be small enough and then you can use this result here. And here I, I also have a one over square root of n. So then the generalization behavior is, you know, roughly speaking, one over square root of n. And so if your n goes to, uh, you know, a large number, then you have a bound, a uniform bound on your generalization error. So that's basically what um, uh, we get, you know, from uh, these types of analysis. And obviously, rather marker complexity is just one measure. There, there are some other measures, you know, even more classical than this, there is a VC dimension that you can uh, compute VC dimension of your hypothesis class in some cases, and then have a uniform bound on your generalization error. And the types of results that you're gonna get is very similar to this theorem that I stated here. So I'm not gonna go into the you know, details of uh, these classical results. Okay, so let me look at the time. Okay, uh, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. You can raise your hand or um, write your questions in the chat box if there are any questions. Yes, Gautami, go ahead. Uh, I I feel like uh, all this this theorem uh, or or this result strongly depends on the fact that uh, the training data we get is the representative of the population, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So that's the whole idea, right? So if your if your number of samples is large enough, then your training sample is going to be a good representative. And if you are minimizing your loss on the training sample, then you know, that will have a good generalization performance in other, uh, you know, test samples that you, you know, get from the same distribution. Uh, so, but how do we know, like, what this correct N has to be? Oh, so with this type of result, you can have a bound, right? You can say with high probability. So if you want to, like, say, have a, you know, 10% error or some amount of error, then you can, you know, see what, value of n, what value of, you know, number of samples that you need to have in order to have some guarantees. But in general, these bonds, you know, are uh, quite loose uh, in practice. So you basically do empirical cross-validation in order to make sure that you don't have a, you know, poor generalization. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this should be the lower bound of the generalization error in general rather than the upper bound. No, 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 no. So uh, the reason that we want to have an upper bound is that we want to guarantee that, uh, you know, this is not going to happen, right? So you want to, you know, bound the worst case performance. You want to say, okay, so no matter what, you know, your uh, training sample is, 
then you are going to have a you know guarantee that your generalization is um, is good. There may be some cases that you may get lucky. You may have one training set and your generalization error is zero for that, but that doesn't you know mean that you have a good generalization performance. Okay. okay. So sure. Uh, there is one question for the example you just gave. Does this imply that normalizing all the input vectors greatly improves generalization error? Not really, right? So uh, I, I think you are talking about this um, uh, this term. Uh, this is just a bound, you know, on the uh, basically the norm of the samples, uh, and that bound is like kind of constant. You know, if you multiply with some constant, that should be fine. Obviously, this shouldn't grow with you know dimension n. With, with the number of samples that you have, in those cases, you'll uh, at least according to this bound, you'll have a poor generalization. Okay, so uh, great. Oh, so hey, so actually, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so can you actually scroll up to the random marker complexity? I have a question about the one variable there. So basically, so in reality, if our age is a classifier, so can we just uh, replace AI with the output of our classifier on the on the ice, on yes. the ice paper? And that's basically it, right? So this F is okay. the composition of loss and the output of the classifier. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Sure. Excuse me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question was that uh, how, how uh, sampling and how, uh, the fact that how smart is that sampling could affect this generalization in this function? Are there, are there any metrics or any theorems like this that you show that number of samples affects generalization that shows uh, the way we sample the training set would affect the generalization? Sure, yeah, like obviously if you have a you know, better way of you know, sampling, you know, depending on how informative samples are, uh, you will have a better generalization. There's like some you know, active areas of research in you know, active learning or online learning that talks about it. But here the setup is that I have N IID samples and I wanna have a bound on my generalization in that in this setup. Okay, good, so uh, let me uh, move on. So the question, so these are pretty classical results, right? So we see dimension of the marker complexity. The one question is that can we actually apply these results to deep models? For instance, what is the rather marker complexity of a deep model? Right? Maybe I can just use these really nice uh, classical results in order to have a bound, a generalization bound on my uh, you know, deep uh, models performance. So let's say H is the class of uh, neural networks with a particular architecture and activation functions. So this H, capital H has a lot of functions. So let's say H, you know, roughly speaking is a neural network with a particular structure. I mean like the number of layers, the activation functions, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at, you know, let's say neural networks with, you know, L um, hidden layers with ReLU activation functions. So that, that defines a member of my hypothesis class. And I wanna compute the marker complexity for this and to see if I can use the result that I talk in order to bound the, um, the generalization uh, performance of that. And let's say for simplicity, I look at the binary classification task, uh, but obviously everything can be extended to multi-label classification. So here the output of my function is either going to be plus one or minus one. Right? So the, again, the idea is that if my rather marker complexity of this hypothesis class uh, is small, then I can use theorem that I described above this theorem or some variations of this theorem. Then I can argue that I have a good generalization. 
performance. So that's the that's the whole idea. Okay, so uh, the answer to this question is in fact uh, being studied in uh, the paper by Zhang and Etienne. And this is the first paper that we have posted on the course web page about uh, deep learning generalization. And they did a very interesting uh, experiment in order to understand this question a little bit more. So they do a randomization test. So what is the idea? The idea is the following, right? So let's, you're giving me a training set, xi, yi. I'm going to use random labels for x's. I'm going to throw away my labels and I'm going to use random labels here. So they have looked into like different, you know, ways of randomization of labels and samples, but let's start with the simplest case. You keep your x's as is, and you are randomizing your labels. Basically, you're, there's no relationship between x and y anymore because uh, you know the uh, uh, labels are basically random. So, what is the generalization error in this case? The generalization error is the difference between the test error and the training error, right? So in this case, what is the test error? Can I compute the test error? Again, even in my test set, the labels are random. Yes, one over number of classes that I have, it's like half, like 50% 50, 50 chance because there's no relationship between X and Y. So in the test time, I'm just going to randomly guess my label. So the test error is going to be half, but it's going to be very bad. So what about the training error? Am I able to fit a function from my neural network family uh, that can map my X's, like say images, to some random labels? You know, again, the labels, they can be really arbitrary. And the surprising observation was that yes, in fact, you can fit, you know, neural networks can fit random labels. So in other words, you can push your training error to be really small, to be almost zero. So why this observation is very interesting. So remember, if you take the same neural network, the same uh, hypothesis class that we, we, we are considering here, the same age, and train it on true labels. Let's say if you have images of cats and dogs, you train it on labels of cats and dogs, and then you evaluate your generalization in the test time, you get a pretty good generalization uh, performance empirically. But using the same family of neural networks, when you are randomizing your labels, you get a very bad generalization error, perhaps like the worst in this case, because the test error is like half and you push your training error to be uh, zero. And so what is going on? Okay, so recall that my rather marker complexity is defined as what? So I look at one over N, expectation over different sigmas. I look at the supremum of these functions and I look at uh, some one over N, sigma I, H, X, I. All right, so let's pick a particular uh, sigma. Like sigma is a vector, right? So uh, it's you know basically a random vector. Let's pick a particular sigma 
And let's say I have, uh, I have uh, three samples. Say x1, x2, x3. And for that sigma, let's say sigma one, I wanna you know, have my sample one in partition one, sample two in partition one, and sample three in partition two, minus one. Now, I wanna pick it, an H from my neural network that maximizes the sky. So what function would maximize this? If I have a one, I would like my age to also be one. If I have a minus one, I would like my age to be minus one. Right? So I want my age here to be plus one. I want my age here to be plus one. And I want my age here to be minus one because when I multiply them, I'm going to basically get the maximum number possible, which would be N for that particular sigma, right? This experiment that they showed that for whatever random labels that you have, I can basically fit my H to predict the same label. It means that for almost all of these uh, sigmas that I have, the value that I'm gonna get as a supremum of my, uh, over my h is going to be very close to n. And when I divide it by one over n, so this is going to be very close to one. Right? So the rather marker complexity uh, that uh, we have. So there's a question, why are we maximizing? Uh, that's the definition, right? So that's the definition of the rather marker complexity that I'm looking at the h in my function class that maximizes the basically inner product between the output of my age over different samples and sigmas that are assigned to them. And these sigmas, they define the partitions. But because I can fit the random label, I can always pick an age that has the same sign uh, as of my sigma for a particular sample xi. So this guy can be almost close to n, and then I have one over n here, so my rather marker complexity is going to be very close to uh, close to one. Uh, Phil? Uh, just as a, an aside, this phenomenon of interpolating random labels, do you think this could be observed for other function classes besides neural networks? Not necessarily, right? So if you have a linear, um, for instance, a linear function class, then you cannot realize any, you know, kind of shattering or any kind of, you know, uh, labeling of your uh, your samples. And this kind of shows that with neural networks, you get a pretty strong expressibility of these functions in order to uh, even fit random labels to your samples. And so this is a really neat observation, but immediately that shows that then the rather marker complexity that you have is basically one, which is the maximum number, right? So then that kind of you know indicates that this is not going to be useful, not useful. Um, suppose I had a really high dimensional support vector machine. You think uh, this phenomenon could be replicated? You know, potentially in the, uh, in the over parameterized regime, uh, I think that is possible, you know, but again, it depends on the, uh, the setup that you have here. Right? So even linear functions, if you, if you're in an over-parameterized regime, they are powerful enough in order to, you know, you know, fit the random labels, right? So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about even the linear models, you know, potentially next lecture, uh, depending how much uh, time we'll have to cover these results. But uh, yeah, it is not specific to a neural network, but the observation is that even, you know, a one, you know, a neural network with a one hidden layer, uh, it can, uh, you know, fit random labels. And not only that, they have uh, done a, a lot of experiments on CPAR or some other data set with some of the uh, established uh, architectures like AlexNet or ResNet or uh, some other architectures and they have observed, you know, this phenomena with some different, you know, some small differences obviously depending on the architectures. Uh, but that kind of indicates that all of these results based on VC dimension or rather marker complexity that basically that can limit the complexity of the 
function class in order to have a good generalization bound, they are not going to be useful here. Right? So this basically shows that the marker complexity is not useful, but you can make the same argument that all of the other results based on VC dimension, they are not going to also explain why we have good generalization using neural networks because it is not about the complexity of uh, the function class. There may be some other factors that uh, basically lead to a good generalization uh, behavior. Uh, yes, Anushe, go ahead. Um, I was wondering how it relates to universal approximation theorem. As you said, with just one hidden layer, you can approximate any function. But here you have like a fixed structure and you're choosing uh, among those a structure that has been fixed. How does it relate? Right, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, so there's also another result in this paper about the um, expressive power of neural networks. So maybe if I explain this, then it will be more clear. Expressive power of neural networks. So the classical, again, view to the expressivity of the uh, neural network in the uh, for different architectures was in the population level, right? So, you know, there are a lot of interesting results that look at the population level, that if you have a small function, uh, then I want to approximate it in a universal fashion in every part of uh, basically my entire domain. Right? Uh, very classical results. There are some also recent, you know, results about them. But what this paper shows is that, in fact, what it is important, what is important in practice is to have expressivity in the, over the empirical uh, samples that we are observing. And so in practice, the expressive power of neural networks on a finite uh, sample size. And they show empirically first, it is really powerful, right? So if you give me uh, 1000 samples, I can basically express any labeling on these samples because if I randomly label, uh, I'll basically get a almost zero uh, training error. And they have one uh, result about this. Kind of stated without the proof, the proof is not difficult. And they say basically there exists even a two layer neural network with ReLU activations and two times n plus d parameters. N is the number of samples, D is the dimension of uh, each of the samples that uh, we have. So this function can represent any function on a sample size N in D dimension. So in other words, I need a little bit of an overparameterization, right? So n is the number of samples that I have. I don't need like n to the power d or exponential uh, uh, number of parameters in my samples. I just need two times n plus d as the number of my parameters. Then I can have a expressive, you know, express any uh, labeling that I want, any random labeling that I want over uh, my samples. And that's one really important observation. And uh, effectively speaking, that rules out the usefulness of a lot of classical results that we have in uh, learning theory in terms of the marker complexity or VC dimension as they are in order to extend it to explain the generalization of uh, neural networks. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Good. So let me look at the time. Okay, so um, 
don't think we have time. Uh, are there any uh, final questions about these results? Can we see the end of the last slide? Thank you. Yeah, so basically, this is a theoretical result about that empirical observation that even with a one hidden layer neural network, you are able to uh, represent whatever labeling that you want to have on n samples that you have in d dimension. So again, if you think about it, this is an over-parameterized regime. So you have more parameters than the number of samples that you have. And that's basically why we have such a strong uh, result in terms of fitting uh, my uh, function to even random labels.